Hola, mis hermanas y mis amigas. Greetings. I thank the Lord for this blessed opportunity to still be part of the First John book study. And it's an honor to not just study the Word of God, but be given the privilege to impart it. It's an honor, a privilege, but it's also very humbling knowing that it's there's great responsibility as we impart or share it. Now, uh, praise God for a technology that despite the distance, I I'm still able to participate in this. Please forgive my voice as I am still on the way to recovery from cough and cold, but I'm good. So we have much to cover. So vamos a orar. Let's pray. Oh, great God, the maker of heaven and earth, Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace that you have revealed yourself to us through your word, through your world, and through your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who is the word. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you. Thank you for our salvation that you have given us this blessed privilege of seeing the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ and giving us the Holy Spirit who enables us not just to understand but even to apply your word. We also thank you for even giving opportunity for others to hear your word and to see that you to taste and see that you are good we pray that for those who will be joining us today and yet have not yet surrendered their lives to Christ will have the thirst and desire to surrender their lives to you, to see your beauty, to glorify you in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for how you will guide us in our study today and how you will enable us to apply it in our lives. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first and loving us immensely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, <clears throat> last February 2023, we started this series of Book of First John, and I mentioned that we are going to the forefront of the battlefield. And before I continue, let me just uh, share my slides that will help us and will guide us in our study. There we go. I I mentioned that we are going to have to be in the forefront of the battlefield. Why? Because you're going through the distinguishing marks of true followers of Christ from those who are not. It is a battlefield because the wrong teachings about Christ now are as prolific, if not worse, than when this book was written. And as long as they do not sus subscribe to the Christ of the Bible, then in simplistic form or term, it is Sunday Christ. The call unto faithfulness to the Bible as the immutable, inerrant, authoritative word of God never wanes. We are still called to be unashamed ambassadors of Christ wherever he may be. 
Now, if you may allow me to use the 11 tests of salvation by Pastor John MacArthur from one of the chapter of his book, Saved Without a Doubt, which is available in GLCC Library for those who have not yet read that book. It's a wonderful small book. So you can borrow that from the library. And we will use that 11 test. You have not yet covered all the 11 questions, but you will see, I think we have covered until question number five. So let's go through the different questions. Number one, do you enjoy fellowship with God and Christ? From First John 1, 2 to 4, we talked about the biblical Christ and we also talked about how wonderful it is to have fellowship with Him, with God the Father, God the Son, and also with the church. Do you, have you experienced that wonderful communion with Him? The trust, and do you have a love for them that draws you to their presence? Now, have you experienced that refreshing, almost overwhelming sense of grace that comes upon you when you discover a new truth in His Word? If you have, then you have experienced the fellowship of salvation. Next question. Are you sensitive to sin in your life? Are you aware of the spiritual battle raging within you? And do you realize that to have true communion with God, you have to live a holy life that you can't walk in darkness and claim to have fellowship with Him? Now, are you like Paul who sometimes cry out? And who, do you sometimes cry out with Paul, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Because you're so weary of the burden of sin in your flesh? If so, you are obviously a Christian. And since salvation is secure, you might as well enjoy it and be fully assured. Third question, do you obey the scriptures? If you desire to obey the word of God out of gratitude for all Christ has done for you. And if you see that desire producing an overall pattern of obedience, you have passed an important test indicating the presence of saving faith. Okay. Question number four, do you reject this evil world? Do you reject its false religions, damning ideologies, godless living, and vain pursuits? Instead, do you love God, His truth, His kingdom, and all that He stands for? If you reject the world and its devilish desires, that is an indication of new life in Christ. Number five, do you love Christ and eagerly await His return? If you find yourself longing for the return of Jesus Christ, that's the evidence of salvation. It's an indication of a new nature within which longs to be delivered from a body of sin while becoming like the perfect Christ. So these are the first five questions that summarizes what we have covered so far. We are now in the section of the Christian's incompatibility with sin. And knowing that God is a God of light, and in Him there is no darkness of, at all, then if a person who claims to follow God and He is light, then, therefore, darkness within us will continue to be dispelled as we continue to walk with the light. Thus, Christian will be incompatible with sin. So we are in this section of the requirement of righteousness covering 1 John 3 verses 4 to 10. And the question here 
in the series of, in the 11 test of, uh, that Pastor John MacArthur uh, has written is, do you see a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? Take note, righteousness is not required to be saved. That would be that would mean salvation by works, and that is not what the Word of God is teaching us. But righteousness is required to prove that you are saved. Remember, that is the very reason why First John was written, so that you may know that you are, you have eternal life. Amen. So, let's go through the outline. Our topic for today, I have divided into four parts. The law and sin. What's the relationship of between the two? The nature and practice of Jesus Christ. The nature and practice of children of God. And the nature and practice of children of the devil. Now, let's read First John 3, verses 4 to 10. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has, has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Let's dissect them. First part, law and sin. Questions in my mind when I was studying this, is what is the law? And what is the purpose of the law? And why it is called, said there, sin is lawlessness. And if you have seen in the material that I have shared with you, I have attached a good resource to talk about the law of God. There's an extensive discussion of what the law is. But for the interest of time, I would ask you to just read on that and I will just summarize it here in our study tonight. today. Law in the Bible could pertain to a lot of things, but ultimately point to one thing. It could mean God's absolute demand on his moral creatures. It could mean God's word written or the scripture. It could mean the Mosaic Covenant, whose central purpose was to reveal God's character, man's sin, and his redemptive plan. It could also mean the law of Christ, who I love Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did not just clarify the holy requirement of the law from outward behavior to inner surrender, but also fulfilled the whole law and but ultimately okay ultimately <clears throat> the law of god is god himself now is there any contradiction as to what it would what it could mean from the earlier descriptions <laughs> not at all no, not at all, because everything else mentioned a while ago is either from God, through God, and for God. I would like to quote, first and foremost, we must think of the law of God in 
terms of God. The triune God is the law because his will and nature is the moral standard of the universe. For this reason, God alone has the right and authority to determine what is right and wrong and to hold his moral creatures, both human and angelic, accountable to whether they have perfectly obeyed his commands. And that is the law. So, that's the law. Now, let's look at what sin is. Sin is defined as falling short of the glory of God. And we know, we have heard this a lot of times, all have sinned against the holy God. Actually, it is through the knowledge of the law that we learned that we have sinned. Romans 7, 7. Therefore, what is the relationship of law and sin? Every time we sin, we act as if there is no God. Because sin is lawlessness. And every time we act as if there is no God, we sin. Now, it is not just applicable to the big sins, but also to what Pastor Jerry Bridges calls in his book, respectable sins. Whenever we sin, we act as if there is no God. Now, let's allow God to examine our hearts at this point. And let me ask you these questions that I have placed also in your material. Dear women of God, when the one were nurturing, so I designed the questions in relation to us women and our calling as nurturers, not just maybe probably first primarily in our homes, but if you don't have your own child like me, maybe pamangkin, uh, um, sobrino, sobrinas, um, or even younger sibling or, or disciples, people that were entrusted to you to be followed up. So when the one we're nurturing is sinning and we are witnessing it, how does our heart respond? Do we get mad because we are inconvenienced or because our child is living as if God is absent? And the woman of God, when you're sinning against the Lord, do you cry because you're afraid that you might be disciplined? or lose a blessing, or because you are realizing that you are living at that very moment as if God does not exist. I tell you, I'm so much guilty of that. Whenever I go ahead of God, whenever I worry, whenever I panic. And so that's the first part, law and sin. Let's proceed to the second part. The nature and practice of Jesus Christ. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 8b, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. He had a more extensive study of Jesus Christ as taught in the Bible in the first few parts of this series. And it was one of John's purposes in writing this epistle, after all, to correct the proliferating wrong views of who Christ is. And in the, these 
few verses, we are given a peek of the nature and practice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's look into his nature. And in him, there is no sin. I'd like for you to read these verses in or Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. First Peter 2.22, 2, 2, he who committed no sin, there was any deceit found in his mouth. He made him who knew no sin. So that is the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is holy, never sinned. And here's the practice of Jesus Christ. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and to destroy the works of the devil. So allow me to share with, with you some questions I asked myself coming from the discussion of sin, this lawlessness, did Jesus... So my first question is, how did Jesus take away sins? Did Jesus take away sins by erasing the law? <laughs> of course not, right? He took away sins and destroyed the works of the devil by living a humble, holy, sinless life. He fulfilled the law, all of it. He died an unjust and humiliating death, and he resurrected from the dead, showing that he has conquered death and sin. Now, let's try to look into tabular form of what he did and what he destroyed in in Romans 6:23 and 2 Corinthians 5:21 Galatians 3:13 Romans 5:8 to 10 you will see there the substitution our sins became his his righteousness became ours the propitiation that the wrath of God was satisfied. It was all taken by our Lord Jesus Christ. And now because of that, we stand justified. Not because we are righteous, but because Christ is because of that, he fulfilled the penalty, the wages of sin, which is death. He destroyed death. And because of that also, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen. What else did he practice? He is continually sanctifying us. We are being transformed into his image from glory to glory. And what did he destroy? He destroyed the power of sin. With the Holy Spirit in us, we can now say no to sin. What else? In 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ compels us to live not for ourselves anymore, but for him who lived, died, and lived again for us. He destroyed the pleasure of sin. There's no more desire in sinning. And praise God that in the future, he already sealed this on the cross. This work was complete, the telestai. But it's it's as if it's already done. You know, 
consider it done even if it's not yet happening consider it done because christ already has sealed our future glory the glorification for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers in that he will destroy the presence of sin praise god for what jesus christ has done for us now my second question does if jesus took away sins why are believers still sinning why are still why are believers still committing them and here's an answer because we have not yet been removed from the presence of sin and although we have been given a new nature in christ that new nature still lives in this body of death so there's still sin and we still fall into that into it thus we need to live a life of repentance and we are exhorted to live by the Spirit so that we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's the second point. The nature and the practice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pause and reflect. Dear women of God, the nurturers of home, nurturers, nurturers of precious souls entrusted to our care what is our focus in teaching our children is it just trying to teach them good manners and right conduct to be disciplined or do we strive to show them the beauty of our lord jesus christ so that obedience will come from within Dear woman of God, how is your gaze on Christ? Have you considered the majesty and humility of your Savior that he has taken the penalty of your sins upon him? And does this gaze encourage you to live a life of obedience? Do you see his holiness and hatred of sin? Then I pray it will cause us to obey. Third part. The nature and practice of the children of God. No one who abides in him keeps keeps on sinning little children let no one deceive you whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous no one born of god makes a practice of sinning for god's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of god now let's see the nature and the practice of the children of God. First, you'll see that children of God, they are described here as righteous. What does righteous mean? They're equitable by implication, innocent, holy. Now, the same word used to describe it's non-existence saying in Romans 3 10 there is no one righteous not even one was also the same the same word used to describe the one who shall live by faith in Romans 1 17 the righteous shall live by faith now are there really righteous ones or none so let's see the other descriptions of that righteous one it says they're born of god and 
God's seed abides in him. We know that we know that seed. It is the Parakletos, the Holy Spirit. You're now given the privilege to be called Son of God. Not with a capital S, but with a small s. You are given a new nature and therefore righteous in the eyes of God. So let's draw the conclusion then. Apart from God, there is really no one righteous. But the one who is born of God, to those whom he gave the right to become children of God, to those whose God's seed abides, then they are righteous. If you are in Christ, wow, you are called by God as righteous. Amazing. Unfathomable. So, if that child of God is righteous, then this is the practice of the child of God. First, he abides in him. He remains in him. He reads and obeys his commandments, not in a legalistic way, but out of a desire to live a holy life for the one who saved him from his sins. He also practices righteousness. True believers of Christ were not saved just to be passive creatures who are trying to escape punishment. But genuine salvation brings forth the fruit of righteousness. You're not just staying away from sin, but you are seeking to do good bearing fruit of righteousness towards others. And in verse 9, cannot keep on sinning. He does not make a practice of sinning. So as Christ has already destroyed the penalty, the power, the pleasure, and in the future, praise God, he will be destroying the presence of sin. A true believer will not keep on sinning. A true believer will not keep on sinning. Now, it's time for us to pause and reflect. Dear women of God, dear nurturers of home, have you sat down to examine what is your constant plea to the Lord for your children? Do you find yourself just praying for the temporal things of this world for them? Lord, yung kakainin nila, yung, yung load po niya sa cellphone. Lord, yung, yung course niya. I'm not saying that there's something wrong with that, but are we just praying for those temporal things? Or do we plead for their salvation, especially when we see them repeatedly sinning? Dear woman of God, have you knelt before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who gave you the Parakletos, the Holy Spirit? For he has committed to finish the work that he has started in you. Yung seed na yan, that's the seal of God's work in us. If you haven't done that for, for a while, I pray we'll take this time to pause and reflect and pray and thank God for who he is what he has done for us. Let's go to the last part. The nature and practice of the children of the devil. 
verse 6b, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Children of the devil, let's see their nature and practice. So take note, there's no gray area in the word of God either. They are children of God or children of the devil. If they have not yet surrendered their lives to Christ, then the word of God is not toying around with us here and giving us some nice names. But it's a description of children of the devil. And what's the nature of the children of the devil? It's of the devil. They're unholy. Why? Because, um, because he has been sinning from the beginning. And with this kind of nature, these practices come out. What are these practices? Children keeps on sinning. Okay. Practices sin. And coming from the Greek word poion, this word means not just doing, but even manufacturing. So it's not just something that, you know, he made me do it. Not that. But there is the practice of making, of imagining, of manufacturing sin in a prolonged form. A person who has not yet surrendered their life, his or her life to Christ, will not be able to say no to sin. For he has not seen or known him. Not just a physical seeing of Christ, but the spiritual transformation that makes one see his great sinfulness and infinite need of a Savior. And we know that word no, <laughs> not just a mental capacity, but understanding of who Christ is and what he has done for us. Just like what Paul has described in Philippians chapter 3, that everything else, all of his accomplishments, they are nothing. They are but rubbish compared to knowing Christ. It's how beautiful knowing Christ is. And so what's the practice of the children of the, the devil? Makes a practice of sinning, keeps on sinning, and does not practice righteousness. And you might say, Pero, but there are people who, who look, they look, Kinder, nicer, more, more pleasing than Christians I know. So why are they not righteous in the eyes of God? Because, as the Word of God says, they are continually depending on themselves even as they do good works. And Isaiah tells us that these good works done on our own are like filthy rags before the eyes of God. So in the eyes of God, they still do not practice righteousness. 
meet God's standard, it has to be holy. No traces of sin. And the last part, does not love his brother. A true follower of Christ, we love the ones whom Christ loves. So this will be discussed further in the next TGIS. Let's now pause and reflect for some questions. Dear women of God, dear nurturers of home, where is your confidence in the change of your child's heart? Is it in your ability to love them and organize everything so they will follow your orders? Or do you throw yourself into your unto your maker, knowing that he alone can change his or her heart? Dear woman of God, have you examined your response when you see a disobedient, a sin-practicing child, a churchmate, or even outside of church? You find yourself running to the Lord and pleading for this lost soul. Or do you see yourself blaming the people taking good care of him or her? No. I'm not trying to remove the responsibility from their parents or the ones who are called to nurture them too. But my point is ultimately, where do we run for the change of heart of our children? Let's conclude our discussion. First, nature precedes practice. Righteousness is an inevitable fruit of true salvation because Christ has already made you righteous. The substitution, propitiation, justification, sanctification. regeneration and future glorification. Therefore, if that nature has already been imparted to you, then you are expected to be righteous, practicing righteousness. It's a process. It's not an overnight thing, but that's why the question is, do you see a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? Because as Steve Lawson says, serious Christians take sins seriously. Do we often take time to reflect on how much have we have grown? Have we grown from the past year? Are the things that the Lord trying to deal with us still the same things that um, that He's still dealing with us, and we haven't been learning or anything? Well. I pray that you see growth. Now, praise God for our God is faithful and true to complete the work He has started in our lives. If you are already in Christ, then this is sure. Christ will complete his work. Christ already did. He already completed it. It's just a matter of it happening. Right? So, praise God. 
for His grace and His mercy. Let's now pray and take this time to really to worship our faithful and true God. Oh Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for what he has done for us and what he is continually doing in us and through us. It's such a privilege, Lord, that despite us, you, in your grace and your mercy, are using us also as instruments to share your word to others. Lord, thank you. It's all because of you. Nothing about us, but all about our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, with all of the things that you have allowed us to study today, help us to apply them. Help us to be more discerning. Help us to be more prayerful. Help us to be more joyful with the assurance that you have given us and also hopeful for you are the God who will complete the work that you have started in our lives, in the lives of the people that you have entrusted under our care and in the lives of many more whom you will reach through the preaching of your gospel. We pray, Lord, for more workers in the field, more people who will support the work, the work in the field, and that you will just continue to cause your people, your elect, to respond to your truth, grow in church, and honor you with their lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for our fellowship today. May you be magnified in our time of sharing and reflection and even our application of this truth in our daily lives. Do you be all glory and honor, Lord, as you move in our lives, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in the places that you have brought us in, in our churches. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.